here we are, the third Sunday of Easter. Yet, the passage from the Gospel which forms the basis of our text is still about that first Sunday, that Easter Sunday, when Jesus rose from the dead. We have in our text two of the disciples, two of those who followed closely what Jesus was teaching and what Jesus was doing. They were not a part of the twelve apostles. As our text would show, there were eleven that had gathered in Jerusalem. The one Judas Iscariot had already taken his life. So in our text, we have these two disciples, one we know as Cleopas, and the other disciple we don't have a name. But they set out, going, probably leaving Jerusalem, going back home to Emmaus. And as they were going along, they, they, they had conversation with each other, which is normal. If two of you are walking along, or even sitting in the same space, chances are you will be sharing in the same conversation. You will be sharing with each other. And so these, these two disciples set out on their way home. As the text ends, you see that they live in the same place. Probably brother and sister, brothers, probably they were also relatives, who knows? Could be brother, could be cousins, could be uncle and nephew. But they traveled back home. And while they were doing that, our text tells us that Jesus came up and Jesus walked with them. understand what had happened on Good Friday was still very fresh in their minds. What had happened earlier that morning was still fresh in their minds because they remembered that the tomb was empty. They remembered that the women told them that they, they had this encounter with angels. And they knew that somehow, somewhere, Jesus was nowhere to be found. And so as they walked along this pathway back home, and as Jesus came upon them, they began to engage with Jesus, and Jesus, with purpose, started to ask them questions. What it is that you guys are talking about? as if he didn't know. <clears throat> he not only asked them what they were talking about when they said, are you the only one in, Jer in Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened with this Jesus of Nazareth? As if to say, you must be crazy. Everybody knows what happened. You must be the only one if you're asking us what it is that we're talking about. As I read this text though, I discovered that the theme that runs through it is a, a desire on Jesus' part to connect with people. Jesus seemed intended or, or bent upon connecting with them. And it occurred to me that it's the same way today. Jesus wants to connect with us. But as we look at the text, as we heard it read, or as we ourselves are reading it now, there are four things that I believe we need to observe or to do if this connection that Jesus seeks to have with us is going to happen. Four things. The first thing is that like those disciples, 
We have to have an open stance. Jesus came and he went with them. You know, if they did not have an open stance, they could have shut Jesus out, behave as if he didn't exist. But no, these two disciples welcomed him to join them. And like them, we also need to have this open stance where we welcome Jesus to join with us. To be open requires that we are accessible. It requires that we not shut people out. It requires that we are vulnerable, open, in a sense, naked. But above all else, to be open, to have an open stance requires that we become available. In a sense, no pretenses. Jesus wants to connect with us. In the midst of our being shut in, in the midst of our lockdown, in these times of COVID-19, Jesus wants to connect with us. He comes alongside us and he wants to go with us. He wants to connect with us upon our life's journey. But the question is, do we want to connect with Jesus? He surely wants to connect with us. But are we sure that we want to connect with him? So the first thing that we need to do if we are going to have this connection with Jesus is that we need to have an open stance. The second thing though is that we need to be willing to partner with Jesus. So let's say that we are open, that we are available, that we are vulnerable to Jesus, that somehow we open ourselves up to his joining us being involved in our lives, we now need to partner with him. Partner with him so that we can have a more deep experience with him, a deeper experience with him. You know, when we look at our text, we see that these two disciples, when Jesus asked them, what things that happened? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet. And they go on to say that they hoped that he was the redeemer of Israel. In a sense, they were showing up their partial knowledge and experience. This is the Jesus I know. This is the one who was crucified. This is the one that the chief priests and leaders had handed over to be crucified. But that was partial. That knowledge and experience was partial because if those disciples, Peter and the other disciples, stayed long enough at the tomb, they would have had the same experience that Mary had. Mary's experience was complete because she was willing to linger at the tomb long enough to encounter Jesus. We must be willing to partner with him. And to partner with Jesus requires that we not limit ourselves to our partial knowledge and experience. It requires that we are open, but at the same time willing to walk with Jesus. Willing to have conversation with Jesus. Willing to be real with Jesus. You see, to partner requires risking. It requires stepping into a vulnerable place. If you and I would have this connection that Jesus seeks, we have to be willing to partner with him. We have to be willing to risk ourselves, our safety, what we know, what we have experienced, 
Put that on the line so that we can have a more full experience, a fuller experience. But that only comes from partnership. You see, there are some persons who want to, to, to say they want to have a connection with Jesus, but they're not willing to partner with him. In the midst of our COVID-19 lockdown, if we want to experience Jesus, if we want to have a fresh encounter with him, it's not enough just simply to be open. We have to be willing to partner with him so that the experience, the encounter with Jesus is experienced at its fullest. But not only must we be of an open stance, not only must we be willing to partner with Jesus, we also need to entertain Jesus. You know, our text says that as they came upon where their home was, Jesus was heading beyond them. And they asked Jesus to stay with them. And yes, they came up with the excuse. Night is almost here. Stay with us. You see, we must understand that Jesus not only wants to make a connection with us, but he is willing to stay with us if we ask him, if we ask him to be, to entertain Jesus is not to perform for him, you know. You know, like when we entertain somebody, we sing, we give jokes, <laughs> we make merry. To entertain Jesus requires that we are hospitable to Jesus. It means that we must be willing to make space for Jesus, make space in our lives for Jesus. If we are going to be entertaining Jesus in our lives, we need to not only make space for Jesus, we need to be willing to allow him to come into our space, into our life space. And to impact our lives. If there's ever a time that we need to entertain Jesus, it's now in these times of COVID-19. When the news day in, day out tells us that there are more and more persons who are being infected. But at the same time, more and more persons are dying. Yes, we have heard about the, the peak. We have heard about how this has flattened. But yet, it's dangerous and we know that if we go outside unprotected, we run the risk of contracting COVID-19. We need to entertain Jesus in our space, in our lives, in our homes, in our aloneness, in our loneliness, even in the midst of our sadness or our depression. So yes, you and I need to have an open stance if Jesus, if this encounter with Jesus is going to happen, if Jesus is going to connect with us, we have to have this open stance. If Jesus is going to connect with us, we need not only to have the open stance, but we need to be willing to partner with him. And if we are willing to partner with him, we need to be able to entertain him. That is to make space in our lives for him. But then we must also be willing to live a life that is normal. And he in turn will renovate our lives so that we cannot be the same. To live in a state of normal life, it requires that we live in a necessary way. Put another way, we need to be willing and ready to shed ourselves of all the pretenses. Yes, we might have learning or education. We might have long experiences in whatever area or career. But Jesus asks of us by his presence that we not pretend to be what we are not. Not to put on ears, but rather to remain open and welcoming. In other words then, 
be our true selves, not pretending, not trying to protect ourselves from him. In other words, then when we are normal, Jesus will have an authentic, a genuine relationship with us. And the true question is, how normal can we get? How normal are we willing to be? See, some persons behave as if they are invincible, that somehow in these times, this, this disease, this virus will not affect them. But we know it's not about how old you are, because it affects young persons too. Just recently, we heard of babies who died as a result of this virus. So yes, how much do you want Jesus to connect with you? Those two disciples, they talked about how their hearts burned within them while they walked along the way. How much is your heart burning? How much are you longing? How much are you desirous of connecting with Jesus? When all is said and done, you know, without Jesus in these times, you are on your own. Without Jesus with you in the midst of your lockdown, or lockdown, you are alone and not much hope is left. My mother used to say, no matter how terrible the storms of life are, if Jesus is in your boat, you can smile at the storm. Can you really smile at the storm that is going on around you? Or are you trapped, gripped by fear, scared about the future? despairing about life. Jesus comes though, offering us an alternative. He says to us that I am with you always. I'll be with you to the end of the age. He comes offering us life. He says that the thief, fear, scare, terror, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he comes offering us life. My prayer is that each one of us will experience this reconnection with him. And as we go through life, we'll have this openness to him. We'll have an open stance. We'll partner with him. We'll entertain him and we will be normal, open. May God be with us today and every moment of our lives. Amen. Amen. And so I ask us to turn to God in prayer as we sing this hymn, God of grace and God of glory. And as we prepare to go to God in prayer, I invite you to, if you have your hymnals with you, 577, we will sing verses 1, 3, and 4, as these verses truly reflect the cold response in these times. If God has been talking at your heart strings, I invite you to give yourselves to Him and allow Him to have His way with you. Let us sing God of grace and God of glory and then go into prayer. God of grace and God of glory, God of people that fall. All thy name, the church's story, bring her blood to
opportunities to give up and to give in. These are hard times, these are difficult times, and often persons around us are driven to fear. But we know, O oh God, that in you we have safety. You said it in your word that you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were formed, the area was created, you are God. And so it is to you, God, that we turn now, seeking your help, seeking your deliverance, seeking your rescue. Rescue from this storm that has been cast against us. So Lord, we ask you now to be with those who are ill. Be with those who are struggling for life. We ask you especially, O oh God, for those in these times who have been inflicted by this virus. Give them relief, O oh God, give them deliverance. You are the great physician, and we look to you for our healing. Lord, we commend before you those who have lost loved ones to this virus or to whatever the cause. And we ask you, Lord, to be with them, to be their comfort, to be their encouragement. We lift up before you at this time, O oh God, our brothers and our sisters, Sister Sandra, who lost a close friend and one for whom she also cared. We lift up before you, Minister Labisi, who lost a close family friend. We lift up before you, Sister Johnson and the Johnson family, who have been plagued out time after time with death, especially over these past three years. So many of their family members have died, and some have died in this COVID-19 process. We lift up before you, Sister Minister Ivy Dawson, who have lost a friend, a friend in the neighborhood, but a friend that is close to her husband. We pray, oh God, that you will be with them. We lift up Sister Renee to you, O oh God, who have lost one who was close to her as also the parent of one of her wedding party persons. Pray for those who are homeless in this time of COVID-19. Lord, we also remember those who have lost loved ones, Reverend Fairweather, the Edwards family, and all the other families, oh God, those who are in the hospitals. Remember, oh God, the hospital workers, those who are on the front line, 
whether they work in the hospitals or seek to provide easy transit around the city, wherever the essential workers are, oh God, we pray that you put a protective wall around them so that this coronavirus will not adversely impact them. We pray for the church, oh God, and you know far more than we do what the state of the church is as also what the future of the church is. And so, Lord, we place it in your hands, asking you to do as you see fit. And then, oh God, those things which we fail to bring before you in our prayers, we ask that you add according to your will as you see fit, because we ask you these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. And God's people say, Amen. 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 And amen. Okay. So, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. But even as I thank you, I want to just give you, remind you of some opportunities for ministry. Remember to bear in mind those who have lost loved ones. I've called some of those names. You can go back and visit this, this, this video, this, this service and find those persons and call them and encourage them. There are persons who are sick, some as a result of the virus, others have been sick prior to the virus and are still sick, and so I encourage you to remember them as well. I also remind you that you need to check upon your neighbors, especially the elderly, call them, and inquire of their well-being and be their link to a robust world that still continues despite COVID-19. So I also encourage you to check in with others. Let people know that you're okay and inquire as to whether they are. Persons still continue to inquire as per how they might be able to send or give their tithes and their offerings to the church. And so I encourage you to mail it. Mail your offerings in and we will indeed appropriate that offering as per the givers. So we encourage you to do that. Hopefully by next week, everything should be up for the online giving. Uh, but there are others who might want to do this by bill pay. And if that's your choice, then I encourage you to do just that. And um, call us during the week and you will have the bank information. And if you call that number I had given before, the 978 number, you'll find there the information, bank account information, so that you could make your contribution toward the ongoing work of ministry of our congregation. Want to thank our Minister of Music who showed up this morning unannounced came to offer his gifts to see to it that we have music. That is Brother Savage. So thank you, sir. Thank you for coming and for offering your gifts to God in this worship service. Also want to thank Reverend Beverly Hardis Fairweather, who for all these weeks of services have been leading the worship service. She's the liturgist and the him sing person and, and what? The dance person. Everything and the dance, dance as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for her uh, commitment to this process. Also want to thank Taj for doing the live streaming. Um, he's the one who makes this happen. And in addition to that, want to uh, thank Brother Thornton. What a Saunders came this morning, not only to worship, but to assist with setting up and seeing to it 
that everything runs smoothly. I don't want to thank all of you who tuned in, whether you be a member of the church or not. We thank you for joining us in worship, and we trust that when we are able to come back into this space to worship together, that you will find reason to come and join us here. But thank you for your commitment and your facilitation of this worship service. Thank you, and may God bless you. And so, Reverend Clayweather, where we go. 671. Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. benediction. God still is with us no matter what goes on around us. He is still within us as that stabilizing presence, as that presence that brings hope in a hopeless and despairing situation. The prayer is that God will be with you today that God will walk with you in the midst of your life's ups and downs. That God will never leave you nor forsake you. That you'll find in God a faithful friend. One upon whom you can depend. And so may God the Father who loves and takes care of you. God the Son who redeems you by his life, death and resurrection. God the Holy Spirit who continues to give life to you and to me, may God be with us today and every moment of our lives. And God's people say, Amen. amen. And we sing, Amen. 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 Thank <laughs> you.